Okay, welcome to week number two. This is chapter one on managing risk in CIS 4670. Uh, and this lecture, we're going to cover uh, what we have to do in order to manage risk. And let me just kind of preface this by the first couple of pages of the chapter, pages four and five. There's a lot of terminology uh, on those uh, pages, and that kind of sets the tone for all the chapters. The Security Plus certification exam, uh, when they are not trying to do conceptual questions, they throw just basic terminology questions at you. So it's a memorization game. And in this chapter uh, on managing risk, you have a lot of terminology, a lot of vocabulary, for lack of a better term. Uh, that you have to get really comfortable with. Okay? So, that said, this chapter is a good kind of beginning chapter from a security foundation standpoint uh, because we talk about risk. And risk and security go hand in hand because security helps to manage risk, control risk. So, we have to start by identifying and defining what a risk is. So a risk is basically the likelihood of something bad happening to an asset, all right? Uh, an asset being anything of value, right? So an asset could be, okay, we've all had accounting, right? Everybody said, okay, I hope so. I think it's kind of like a prerequisite for this class. Uh, an asset is anything with value. So an asset could be a building, a truck, a piece of equipment, a laptop, a smartphone. But it could also be information, right? It could also be data. For a lot of uh, firms that leverage data in order for them to uh, make revenue, that data is an asset and therefore needs to be protected and therefore is at risk. Just like a truck in a trucking company would be at risk from an accident, from breaking down. If it breaks down, it can no longer make revenue, All right? So you have to be able to explain how uh, risk is handled in an organization and the importances of managing risk come in the form of policies, plans, procedures, and how an organization is going to manage their assets from a risk-based strategy. How do we start this? Well, we need to start by a threat assessment. All right, a threat assessment for the most part, and let me pause here real quick. Most all of you guys, when you get your first jobs going out in industry, you're going to be going into, and I hope, I'm, I'm pulling for you again, you're going to go into these Fortune 100, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies. All right, they've already done a threat assessment. I can guarantee it, all right? If you go into a small, mid-sized business that is growing or a startup, they probably haven't. So if you go into one of these larger companies, you're going to be in a life cycle management phase of threat, meaning you're going to be identifying new threats as they come up, assigning um, a risk value to them or a likelihood that that risk is going to happen, all right, and doing, doing all the calculations, which we're going to talk about here in, in a second. But these risk assessments basically deal with the threats and vulnerabilities that could happen. Let me emphasize that, could happen. And the key components of these risk assessments are basically what's the level of exposure, what's the likelihood of it happening, all right, and then doing a BIA, or a business impact analysis, all right? Meaning, if this occurs, if it's the worst day in my incident response life, what happens next? What's the impact? What's the cost going to be? All right? And we compute this with a couple of simple mathematical formulas. Oh, you guys thought you were done with math, right? Like, ah, oh, I had business calculus. That was hard. This is easy. Don't worry about it. A couple of little calculations, a little bit of algebra here, nothing more. 
All right. We have our annualized rate of occurrence, which is nothing more than the likelihood that something is going to happen based on historical data. Historical data coming from a multitude of sources. It could be our own data that we collect over time. It could be information from logs. It could be information from publicly accessible information from the government or from websites uh, like uh, Hackmageddon that I showed you last week. And that ARO can be used in conjunction with a couple of other variables, a single loss expectancy. So if that vulnerability is exposed, if that risk happens, if we are breached, what is the single loss of that occurrence? Right? How much money is it going to cost us? Along with the annualized lost expectancy. So if that happened once in a year, that would also equal the annualized lost expectancy. But if this breach happened, how, how often is it going to happen? Is it going to happen once a year? Is it going to happen twice a year? Five times? All right. That multiplied will give us that ALE. Okay. So that single loss expectancy times that annual rate of occurrence gives us that annual loss expectancy. So a lot of times, that ARO won't be a whole number. It might be a fraction. Because the likelihood of a breach, I hope it's not once a year. I darn sure hope it's not twice or two or three or five times a year, because if that's the case, you need to fire your CISO, right, or whoever's running security for you. It's typically a fraction. This might occur once in 10 years, 0.1. It might occur once in 100 years, 0 0.01. Right? So that so that is very common uh, as a annual rate of occurrence. Oh, and by the way, you are going to see questions like this on your quizzes and on your midterm. I promise you, you're going to have some risk computations on uh, your assessments. Okay. Now, what we've all talked about here in this last couple of minutes has been quantitative, right? It's all about numbers. It's all about math. It's all about tangible information. All right. And that's really great if what? if we have that information, right? So let's turn it back and let's say we're facing a new type of risk where we do not have data for, all right? Then we gotta use a qualitative methodology. And all qualitative methodology basically is, is opinion-based or a best guess, a best guess. We don't know, we have no data. We have no foundational information to make a, uh, a decision. So we have to guess. And that's what qualitative analysis is all about. So know the difference between the two. You probably will see that again. All right. So the measurements of risk. Now when we get to risk, we look at it from a, well, how often is this going to occur? And this will translate to that ARO. So they throw a lot of these acronyms, alphabet soup, at you. And all you really need to understand is, well, what are the, how, how, what's the definition? You have mean time between failure. What is the average time between one failure to a second failure to a third failure? How many days is that? How many months is that? How many years is that? Okay. And that kind of gives you a resiliency factor of the device or the software or whatever. Then you have mean time to failure, which is the average time to the first failure, the first failure of a device. And hopefully that's a very long time. Okay? That's like years. Then you have mean time to restore, which is basically the average time it takes to recover from a failure, the average time it takes to recover from a failure. All right, so those are all tangible. Those are all different factors that we can calculate. 
The next two, recovery time objective and recovery point objective, are just that. They're objective. They are goals. They are yardsticks that we, we set out there, and we go, this is what we have to hit from a business perspective. Okay? Recovery time. So if we have a failure, how long does it take to recover from that failure? And likewise, recovery point. What is the recovery point that we want to get to? Do we want to get to 50% accuracy? Do we want to get to 100% accuracy? Typically, recovery point is a place in time. This has to do with backups primarily. All right? So if you have a failure, what is your point in time that your backup was closest to reality where you failed? Was it an hour back? Was it two hours back? Was it a day? Was it a week? And that all goes to the calculation of how much transactional um, transactions you basically lost. Transactions are there for what? Money, right? So if I'm running an e-commerce business, for example, and I have a failure, and my most recent backup was only 30 minutes old. Let's just say that. Only 30 minutes old. I, can, I, I lost 30 minutes a day. But in that 30 minutes, how many transactions did I lose? Did I lose one? Okay, hey, not so bad. That's not that big. But... If I'm in the middle of a campaign, a sales campaign, what happens if I lost 20 transactions, 30 transactions, 200 transactions? What's the average transaction size? You're getting to equate that to a dollar amount, right? Sound like, sounds like how you, how you would calculate a risk, right? See how all this ties together, folks? Okay. So... What do we do when our risk assessment is complete? Or what do we do as we are building out our risk assessments over time? Well, we have to have a strategy for those risks. And I'm going to go over four here real quick today. Risk avoidance, which basically looks at identifying the risk and making the decision to no longer engage in actions associated with that risk. It's too risky. We no longer want to do that. So this is a good example of a business saying, we can't go into a certain market. It's too risky. We will lose money. All right? Or we will not make as much money as we expect to make. All right? Investors do this all the time. All the time. Risk transference. So risk transference is where you basically take that risk and you give it to somebody else. What does that sound like, anybody? Y'all have it. I hope y'all have it. I have it. I have it multiple times over. What does that sound like? Speak up, anyone. Insurance? Insurance. Yeah, everybody, everybody has insurance on their car because that's like a state law, right? Okay. And basically, if I run the risk of hitting somebody as I'm driving on campus, which is not out of the realm of possibility, <laughs> beginning to fall every year, right? And... uh I hit somebody or somebody hits me, and that actually has happened to me. Well, I don't have to worry about it. I'm not out of pocket. I pay a premium every month for insurance, and I let them take care of it. Now, what happens if that occurs too often? Your premiums go up, right? Because the insurance company says you are too high of a risk. Exactly. See how this all works? We have the same thing in cyber. We have the same thing with cyber insurance. Cyber insurance is this woo, big thing right now, right? So the problem that we have is it gets a little out of control. I want to just kind of pause here real quick and show you another example of that. So I hope all of you probably have heard of this. Yeah, this is yeah, this is it. So, who, just by a sh quick show of hands, who has heard of Riviera, uh, Florida, the ransomware attack that occurred 
to them this past. Nope. One person. Okay. Well, this was a ransomware attack that occurred this summer, just this past summer. And the hackers basically said, hey, I want 65 Bitcoin. That doesn't sound like a lot, right? Well, it actually was $600,000. And what the city did was they paid it. They paid it, right? It's a small city of only about 35,000 people, all right? And basically, they ended up paying out $592,000. Now, the city did not pay $592,000. The city had cyber insurance, okay? They paid premiums on a monthly basis, and then they had a deductible. Their deductible was 10%. Now, as far as insurance goes, that's outrageous. If you had to pay a deductible of 10% in an accident, a car accident, I would almost guarantee you most of most all of you would not be able to afford that. Okay, I wouldn't be able to afford that. Your deductible might be 1%, 2% tops. 10% is really incredible. So, but the city was only out about $55,000, 60000 that was it. Take that in comparison to cities that fought hackers and fought ransomware, like Atlanta or Baltimore. They actually mentioned Baltimore in this example that paid out $18 million to recover their systems. $18 million. Now, most of that wasn't in equipment. It was in professional services for folks like us. To come into the city and go, oh wow, I got to do a password recovery on this switch, on this switch, on this. I got to go back and do a, a data restore for all these systems. I've got to reinstall the ERP system, what have you. Okay, that's time consuming. And at Atlanta, the city of Atlanta kind of suffered a very similar fate uh, earlier this year. So I just kind of wanted to point that out about risk transference and uh, uh, insurance. Then there's risk mitigation. This is the most common type of uh, acting on risk. This is where you get something to fix or mitigate or minimize the occurrence of the risk. A firewall, perfect example of a risk mitigation strategy, an intrusion and prevention system, antivirus software. Okay, or this could be more um, professional services oriented. An audit that reduces your risk because you identify your vulnerabilities. A vulnerability scan. Okay, and finally, there's risk acceptance, and we only do risk acceptance. When the cost of the mitigation, the cost of whatever we have to do to fix the risk, is more costly than if the risk occurred, right? For example, if I was at risk of losing data, but the value of that data is $5,000, but to put a mitigation in against that risk is going to be $10,000, I'm not going to do it. Because even if I lost that data, I'm out $5,000. Well, I'm out $5,000. But to put the mitigation in, I'm out $10,000. Basic business acumen there. So, um, so we talked a little bit about this morning in class here, risk in cloud computing. And uh, I'm just going to go back and show this for uh, my online students. We went over uh, this. Uh, example in how cloud is now uh, safer uh, than on-premise or not so much uh, from uh, Info Security Magazine. I'll post a link on this in the uh, uh, in this week's folder. So, but cloud computing, which uses these online services. Uh, there's debate as to whether it is more safe, less safe, but guess what? You still have risk regardless. All right. And 
there are ways that you can implement your cloud platform as a service, software as a service, infrastructure as a service. I used to work with an infrastructure as a service provider for the banking industry. And that was a very interesting part of my career. I was a red teamer penetration tester for uh, this uh, service provider. And I was constantly, constantly doing code review and uh, vulnerability scans on a weekly or monthly basis, depending on the platform, depending on the customer, depending on what the contract stated us to do. And then once a year, I would actually get to do red team activities uh, against these platforms, uh, against our operations team. So some risk-related issues associated, compliance, regulatory compliance, uh, privileges, who has access, data integration and segregation. It's the same as if you had uh, an on-premise data center, all right? You still have these issues. You still have these problems. You still have these controls that you have to address. Uh, Amazon addresses them in certain ways. Azure, very similarly. Uh, they do a lot of logging, a lot of tracking, and you have to have to question who has access to the cloud environment itself. And when I mean the cloud environment, I mean the administrative environment, right? So in uh, Amazon, for example, who do you make IAM accounts for, right? Who has control? And then how do you control those IAM accounts, right? How, how, how big of a cloud trail presence do you do for logging? These are the types of questions that go into the cloud um, administrative uh, perspective. So virtualization. Now virtualization is a big piece of the cloud, but we can also have that on-prem as well. Um, breaking out of the virtual machine into the hypervisor environment can happen. It has been, there have been several proof of concepts uh, with both Microsoft Hyper-V and with um, VMware. Now, most of those vulnerabilities have been patched, and VMware and Microsoft have been really, really good about identifying these shortcomings and getting them fixed. But the virtual machine or hypervisor uh, monitoring is just as important as monitoring the operating system on the virtual machine itself. That's kind of what we're getting at in, in that slide. And it comes down to, to the types of policies and standards that you want to uh, put in and what they're going to provide to your staff and to your customers, to your organization as a whole. They need to be well written. So uh, let me ask the class here, what level, what reading level do you think policies need to be written at as a general rule? Anybody want to take a guess? Go. Perfect. Where'd you get that answer? You just pulled it out of the air. Well, good, good guess. Very, see, qualitative example right there. All right, eighth grade reading level. Why? Anybody have a... Okay, so that any person off the street that can get a job at your organization is expected to hopefully have an eighth grade education in this country. All right? Beyond popular belief, most states don't require you to go to high school. They don't. They do require you to go through eighth grade. Most states. Some states, that's uh, more stringent. Some states in certain parts of the country, uh, I'm not going to go there. I'll get mad. All right. Key areas of a good policy. A scope statement. What is this policy about? What does it outline? Okay, what is its goal? An overview, a little bit of background, why we have this, this policy. The actual policy statement, this is kind of like your key sentence, right? It should be clear as possible. Uh, accountability, what happens if you violate this policy? And this is where a lot of small, mid-sized businesses go wrong, okay? They write policies, they have great policies. And then, you know, Billy Joe Bob's 
cousin who's working in the shop out back violates the policy. That's all right. I'll go talk to him. Well, where's the accountability? Why is he not written up? If it's if it's uh, serious enough, why is he not terminated? You see this a lot, all right, especially in nepotistic organizations. Okay, and it's a problem that they that they deal with all the time. And exception statement provides specific guidance about the policy or the procedure that must be followed in order to deviate from the policy. What's the exception? Well, the CEO, small business, mid-sized business, he can do whatever he wants to because guess what? He he signs our paychecks. As bad as it sounds, sometimes that happens. Weighing risk. So, five points here, and this is a test question. So, circled slide 15, check mark it. You will see this again. The scope and purpose of the policy, who owns it, what are the roles and responsibilities, reference, background, why do we do it, are we referencing a NIST document, government regulation, etc. Performance criteria, what are our KPIs, our key performance indicators to ensure that we are meeting this policy, and how do we maintain and administrate it. Who's responsible for over for oversight? Okay, you will see that again. I promise you. All right. So following this guidance, so four minimum contents of good guidance: scope and purpose, roles and responsibilities, guideline statements, operational considerations. Okay, what goes into building the policy? So this is more managing. This is more building. I'm sorry. More. This is more building. This is more managing. Got it backward. Scratch that. All right. Almost done here. Uh, the business policy and primary areas of concern. So a lot of policies, especially in larger organizations, will concentrate on managing people. You're going to have a lot to do with HR, all right? This is why I uh, – do they – they make you take an HR class here at Cal Poly, right? So do they cover any of this, like, um, what to have in a policy, an HR policy, as far as security, personnel security are concerned? I'm curious. Or is it all like – W-4s and benefits and other stuff. Don't know? Okay. Well, from the security perspective, the policies that are put into place um, can be very stringent. For example, uh, in the integration industry that I've worked in, I've worked with several integrators that do work in public sector. One in particular, 75% of their business was in K-12 education. Anybody that they hired, the assumption was that they could be working in a school district and they could be working at a school during school hours. Therefore, their policy was to do extensive background checks, drug screening, all right, and a minimum of three references, and they had to pass all of these criteria before that they were offered a position. And this went from the senior most level engineer all the way down to the cable tech. All right, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. And because they had to have that in their operational um, area, they passed that policy into other areas where they would never be on site at one of these schools. 
So you wouldn't have your HR tech, right, going to one of these schools. Or, but guess what? They still had to pass this criteria. You probably wouldn't have your warehouse guy or gal going to these schools, but they still had to pass this criteria. All right? And I really enjoyed working for this organization because the CEO, managing partner, he held himself to that standard. He held him that himself to that standard, All right? Just like everybody else. So if you can find good companies, even small to mid-sized business, businesses, to work for like that, they they are few and far between, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just say that. All right. So some typical policies that you might see across all businesses is acceptable use, and this could be for internet usage equipment usage, what can I and can I not do with it, um, general security policies. This could be physical control policies, right? So, for example, a couple of places I've worked at, I might not have access into a facility after hours. I might not be required to have that. I might not have any standing all right, but maybe a, somebody like a warehouse person or management, obviously they, they would have standing, and, and they define that in, in different types of security policies. Uh, network and application policies, a big one, remote access policy. Who gets remote access to a system? Why do they need remote access to a system? Do they need it to, in, in performance of their job duties? So we get into some granularity with defining job duties. And when you do that, you can really curtail the potential for an internal breach. And when we talk about these HR policies, these security policies in, uh, of businesses, or organizations, that's what we're basically trying to fight off. We're trying to fight off an internal breach which by far can be more damaging than um, an external breach, okay? Especially if an insider knows what they're looking at, all right? And those of you who are going to throw Equifax out there, okay, that might be the exception to the rule. I get that. It's a good argument. It's also the world we live in these days. Um, weighing risk. So we also... Uh, don't want to cry wolf, right? Everybody's heard the the proverb of the boy who cried wolf, right? He cries wolf, he cries wolf, there's no wolf. Finally, when the wolf comes about, everybody ignores him. Same thing here. That's what false positives are all about, okay? They aren't really incidents. We want to curtail those. We want to minimize those false positives as much as possible. How we do that is understanding the environment that we're in, okay? So if you see certain traffic, network traffic, and it looks like it's malicious, but, oh, that's just the way that the ERP system talks to the printer. It's a false positive. As long as you identify it as legitimate traffic, okay, you can then fine-tune whatever system is triggering that alarm, that alert, that issue, and tell it, I ignore that. And this comes down to implementing that into your business impact analysis. And basically, your business impact analysis states what your primary risks are, what the cost would be if they... Uh, came to fruition, right, and put some monetary value and a percentage of likelihood on it. And then that's a talking point for upper management. So if I have a business impact analysis that says, okay, we have a 25% chance of a data breach that's going to happen within the next 12 months that's going to cost us $25 million. Well, let's put that in perspective. If I'm a CISO for a moderately sized company, 
say a fifty million dollar, hundred million dollar cut to a hundred million dollar company, that's a huge deal. That's going to cause the CEO or the board to go, "What do we have to pay to take that twenty five percent and reduce it down to five percent? What do we have to do to take that twenty five million dollar loss and reduce it to five million or nothing?" Whereas with a conglomerate, a multi-billion dollar conglomerate, $25 million, ah, that's okay. It's going, it might cost us more to fix that than to pay the $25 million. Okay? It's all about weight. It's all about putting it in perspective. Right? It's the old adage, one man's um, shack is another man's castle or something like that. It's all about perspective. All right. Um, our one man's trash is another man's treasure. That's, that, that's the proverb I was looking for. Sorry. All right. And then the last piece of the um, chapter goes over raid. Don't ask me why they put that in this chapter. I have no idea. I think this is just something that the certification test um, writers said, we need a filler for – oh, let's just use this because guess what? CISSP uses it. Um, other certification exams use it. Yeah, rate is important to know. It's important to understand, especially as a system administrator, because it's a way that you can curtail or manage a failure a failure okay and with so many things in security you need to have layers so raid is one good layer and the higher the raid level say raid 5 where you have striping and parity and you have multiple disks if you lose one disk you're okay if you lose two disks you're okay all right but also how do you monitor those failures so when you have one disk that is lost what is the mean time between recovery of that disk? Is it a day? Is it a week? Do you have one on the shelf? We just got to go plug and play. All right? I think one of the reasons they put this in this chapter is it is a good example of how to think about recovery more than anything else. And with larger SANS these days, you get that what they uh, call the white glove service. So Dell EMC, I just installed a uh, a SAN at uh, Coast College District for uh, WRCCDC, and I think we have 22 or 24 terabytes of disk is split up between SSD and traditional uh, uh, 10,000 RPM disks, and that is monitored by EMC. If they have, if I have a disk failure, basically a replacement disk is going to show up uh, at my mailbox at Coastline the next day within 24 hours. And it's just up to me to go plug it in and take the box and put the bag disk in and ship it back to, to Dell. Okay. It can go even further. You can actually have somebody show up with disk in hand to swap it out for you. It's all about price. It's all about how much you want to pay for that to happen. And then you have that time frame. Another good example is Cisco's SmartNet service. Okay, they have different levels. They're different. They're different price. So the most common is their eight by five by uh, NBD. NBD standing next business day. So eight hours by five business days by next business day. So if I have a switch that fails, for example, and it fails at 4 o'clock on Friday, I can expect a replacement 8 a.m. Monday. Then they have higher levels like 8, I'm sorry, like 24-7 by 4 or by 2. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, four-hour replacement, two-hour replacement or next business day. Meaning, if I call into Cisco TAC and say, hey, I've had a switch that's died, I'm going to get one delivered to me in two hours or four hours. 
or they're out of warranty. And and when they go out of warranty, oh, all kinds of bad stuff happens for Cisco. That's when you call the salespeople and go, I want an 80% discount on my next purchase. And they'll do it as long as it's comparable to whatever your loss was. They're really good about that. And it doesn't matter if it's a small little 24-port switch or a huge Nexus core chassis. They'll replace it. They will replace it. And they will have it stored, especially in big metropolitan areas like Los Angeles. Not a problem. They probably wouldn't offer this out in Minot, North Dakota. All right? Not a whole lot of stuff out, out that way. Actually, there are some call centers out there, but you wouldn't get the two-hour or not necessarily, even necessarily the four-hour service. The best you could get would be next business day. And they calculate all that by geography. But I've kind of gone off on a tangent here. Let me uh, wrap up the, uh, the lecture here. Uh, I'm going to... I was going to do that for the next class. Let me pause this. Actually, stop this, and I'll go back to the question. So for my online students... Thanks. I'll post all of those uh, links here uh, today in the um, uh, the folder.